faster than a speeding bullet. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. More powerful than a locomotive. An idea is like a virus. Resilient. Highly contagious. Able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. All right, Carl, it's great to have you on the Better Humanology podcast, man. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, well, we're going to we're going to hit the ground running here. So, how about a fitness challenge for everybody listening? A fitness challenge for everyone listening. Something that I really enjoy doing is trying to get off the ground in as many different ways as possible. And you can challenge yourself to do it with uh, uh, with one hand on your head, with two hands on your head, two hands on your head, one foot off the ground. Uh, go from your belly, go from your back, uh, explore that. That's uh, one of the most fun games that uh, I like to play, and it's very challenging. So like laying down and getting up? Is... Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, just laying down, getting up, or even if you're seated, you can go from a seated position. You'll you'll end up on the ground anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty fun, fun little game. And I actually read somewhere that that was like one of the biggest predictors of uh, longevity or something like that is your ability to pick yourself up off the ground. Yeah, there are several studies around it. Uh, and I, I forget it, the exact numbers, but it's something like 10 years uh, of, of life expectancy uh, change. So uh, you'll discover a lot of things. Yeah, things that you thought were pretty easy that aren't <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah, it's surprising. Awesome, man. Well, how about a mental toughness challenge? Mental toughness. Uh, try to meditate. Yeah, is that a, is that a practice of yours you do regularly? It's definitely something I do on a regular basis. Uh, it varies in terms of how I do it and the duration of it. But uh, simply being able to sit in silence uh, for a little bit is an extremely powerful thing. And if you have no experience meditating, uh, it's not about not thinking. It's about thinking but not succumbing to your thoughts. It's about not judging your thoughts and just sitting there. And uh, it's uh, it's definitely something that I started doing this as a kid, actually. So uh, it's been in my life uh, for a long time. But uh, it became very uh, apparent as a grown-up and a father and a husband and a business owner how important this was to be able to find space and clarity. And uh, it's definitely one of the toughest things that you can do from a mental and yet physical standpoint. And that's pretty interesting, man. How did, how did you pick up uh, meditating so early? Uh, in gymnastics, we, when I was, I guess I was nine or 10, we, we already started doing a lot of uh, visualizing and visual, when you, when you do vis visualization exercises, what, what ends up happening is that first you go into a meditative state and then you go into uh, visualization. So it's, uh, it's definitely an, uh, a practice that we adopted early on and it wasn't even called meditation, but it was a state of, uh, focus and awareness. Okay. Yeah. And that's what I, th I feel like people have a lot of different, uh, names for it or practices. And, uh, yeah, I think sometimes people can be scared of the word meditate, but there are a lot of different ways to, to do it, to approach it. And, and that's really cool that you picked it up at such an early age, man. Yeah, meditation is just uh, the the act of being aware, which is almost um, the same as saying you are contemplating uh, something or whatever it is that you're feeling or thinking. And what ends up happening is that it's almost like going through a Rolodex, you know? If you just keep scrolling through without um, stopping at any particular point, you get to the to the end of it, and at the end of it, there is almost like a, it feels like you open a door to this uh, new space, and this space is very empty in a way, but at the same time full. It's a supported space, and this may sound a little kooky, but it's within that space where all of a sudden uh, this is what people call stillness, or uh, this is what they actually call the meditative state. Uh, and it's a state where um, you, you basically see, hear, feel everything, uh, but you don't react to it. You don't judge it. 
you simply become an observer of of life and within that sometimes uh, little things start to pop up and these become realizations that once you come out of the meditative state uh, give you extreme clarity to be able to act on it and uh, and execute and and usually it's never about executing towards what you want but actually what you need to be able to get what you want I think that's a that's a great breakdown I know when I first uh, the first time I ever meditated you're talking about kind of gaining clarity and direction what the the main clarity and direction I got the very first time I did this was back when I was yeah in the military and I was really doing it out of necessity, just uh, super stressed out. And I could tell my mind was racing and never would slow down. And uh, so I, I got, I, I started uh, meditating several years ago. And the only thing I realized after the fact was the fact, cause I was so calm and clear after I was like the, my main thing that I realized is like, I need to be doing this. It's almost like a different in, I, I don't want to use the word consciousness, but just like almost a different level of uh, existence. Uh, if, if you haven't done it at all, is just like realizing what it's like to be aware. I was so unaware. I didn't know what it was like to be aware anymore. And, and that would just kind of blew my mind when I first did it. Uh, like I said, a while mm-hmm. back. So. Yeah. And I know, I know this is your podcast, but can I, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So, uh, what is it about the word consciousness that, um, you, you wanted to avoid there? Uh, just, it's, and there's no problem or negative connotation with it. It's just overuse. And I like to try and describe things in different ways as opposed to people just hearing the same word over and over, kind of used over and over again. You know what I mean? Right. That's awesome. That's awesome. Because I think I think one of the big things that happens to us as human beings, especially if we're just talking about meditation here for a second, uh, is that we we either uh, move towards something, away from something, or we react, so we move against it. And uh, avoidance of maybe using a word or addressing a topic is one of the, the biggest strategies that people uh, use when it comes to health, fitness, um, uh, doing your taxes, running a business. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> We avoid at all costs uh, addressing things. And I think that's why meditation, in a way, is one of those uh, great things to bring into your your daily practice uh, as what you're calling uh, a mental toughness challenge, uh, and it will it will help you understand that you are avoiding certain things and that you have the opportunity to move towards these things that you're avoiding, and there. Although you will find discomfort, you'll find solutions to the problems that you uh, are dealing with. The obstacle is the way, right? There you go. I right, mean, how about a book recommendation? Well, right now I'm re- I'm reading uh, a book that is is really fun. It's called uh, Earth Is Hiring, and it's by this woman named Peta Kelly. She is an Australian funny girl. Uh, and, and the book is about realizing that, uh, we're not here to change the world. We, we can't change the world. We can't change the planet. We're here to elevate ourselves to, uh, operating at the most aligned, uh, fashion with the planet. And within that elevation of the individual, we also elevate the, the the collectiveness of 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 humankind and and there you will find all of the 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 principles and reasons behind uh, uh the way we behave and it's uh extremely interesting the way that she puts it and she talks about it from a business perspective from a relationship perspective from a physical culture perspective from a nutrition perspective and uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a new new fan of hers. <laughs> yeah, I definitely have to check it out. It sounds very very interesting. Yeah, she's cool. All right, can you give us a little bit of uh, your background, what you're doing now? I mean, go go as far back as you need to, and uh, just bring us up to today. Yeah, um, I have kind of a diverse background. I I, I was born in the U.S. Uh, Swedish parents grew up in Spain. Um, so I did all my schooling in Spanish and, um, I, I lived in a Swedish household with very 
Swedish roots, but uh, had all my childhood development and friends in a very Spanish culture. So uh, I got to live in the in the multicultural domain, and um, and I, as a kid, uh, did gymnastics, and in gymnastics, I I had the the aspiration to make it to the Olympics. Uh, I didn't make it to the Olympics, but thankfully along the way I found action sports and I decided to go to school and study um, environmental science where I specialized in genetic engineering and then eventually marine biology. And that brought me to the U.S. And in the U.S. I I uh, re-found my, my passion for for gymnastics and I did that through coaching And from there, I went into personal training, got into the fitness space, and somehow crossed paths with uh, CrossFit and simply had the the right answers uh, to the the right problems. And I was in the right place at the right time. And uh, somehow I fell into the fitness space. And honestly, I... I could care less about the fitness space. Uh, <laughs> it's it's not my passion. I don't enjoy being uh, even labeled <laughs> to, as as someone that's in the fitness space. But but I am. And uh, what I'm currently doing right now is really um, raising awareness in the importance of physical culture uh, and helping redefine what fitness means. And what I I mean by that is going beyond the universal prescription of what fitness is. And I'll I'll tell you exactly. When I attended my CrossFit Level 1 back in 2007, uh, one of the biggest things that uh, hit me there was when they defined fitness as and they said that it's increased work capacity across broad time and mobile domains. I, I thought that was so beautiful. I was like, oh, that's so awesome. And then, uh, although I love CrossFit, as I as I entered this space of CrossFit, I realized, oh, yeah, this is just a bunch of numb nuts as well uh, chasing the, the same thing. It's just not the physique. It's, it's this other number. It's the same thing I saw in gymnastics and, and all these other sports. And I realized that there was an opportunity to um, – bring some awareness in terms of what it was that one was feeling, what it was that one was thinking, and how we could change our belief system to behave different, act different, and perform at a higher level that goes beyond fitness. And that's what I'm working on currently right now is is helping redefine fitness. And it is about being fit to be a father, fit to be a husband, fit to be uh, an athlete, fit to be whatever it is that you want to be. And that is the exercise. So, so that's what I'm, I'm, I'm currently really putting focus on and, and really making a big shift where um, I'm, I'm moving into a space where uh, without alienating my fitness physical fitness base, I'm tapping into um, the mindset and that higher level performance that I believe is required to be able to make uh, significant change within my lifetime. You know, that's that's very, very interesting. I want to dive into this a little bit more because um, you kind of touched on it. But so, you know, you're talking about being fit, uh, fit to be a father, fit to be a business owner, uh, you know, fitness in general. And I, to be honest, I, I I kind of agree with you because if, uh, you know, there is CrossFit's definition of fitness, which is very, uh, it's, it's almost mechanical, but like, if you, if you were to use the word, the same context, like, is this, is this politician fit for office? You know, the, the, just the word in in general has a, a lot different, uh, meaning. And so what, where are you moving people towards, um, in these other areas beyond physical culture? At the at the moment, I'm more moving them towards me. <laughs> towards you? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, okay. So, so basically, what what that means is simply, I am uh, a mirror of what people uh, see themselves as, experience, um, because I am human. 
just like you are. And I have the same problems, the same concerns, the same stressors. I'm just a guy trying to figure it out. So what I mean by saying that I'm moving them towards me is simply I am striving for unity and peace. And I know that may sound a little uh, strange, but what it really is is um, beginning a dialogue that goes way beyond the thing that people believe that they're actually acting on. And so are you digging into like, okay, so let, let's bring it back to a fitness example. And um, mm-hmm. sorry if I'm, uh, you know, digging in, you know, go crazy too, too much or overthinking it. But uh, no, so, no, so, no, no, go crazy, go crazy. So you're talking about bringing it back to like, if I wanted to get a heavier back squat, as opposed mm-hmm. to just being like, okay, well, let's, let's, uh, let's just figure out how to do that for you. It's more of, let's answer the question of why you even would want that in the first place. Like what, what inside of you would make you want to have a heavier back squat? Uh, mm-hmm. and in the, in the fitness example, is that what you're helping people do across multiple different areas? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, so, uh, I think we're, we're very familiar with the why, and uh, someone who has uh, done a really good job at putting emphasis around the why is someone like Simon Sinek. Yeah. And he's done a great job. The truth is the why is extremely difficult for people to uh, get to. A better question, in my opinion, is for what? Okay. For what, for what is a way more objective question? It doesn't put you in a subjective space. So... You say, hey, I want to uh, back squat 500 pounds. I would ask you, for what? And then uh, they may say, you know what? I'm I'm competing in this powerlifting meet, and uh, I want to win. And if I get the 500 pounds in my category, uh, let's say it's a woman, uh, I will be winning my my age group and my my weight class. Okay, fantastic. Now, uh, what do you want to win for? For what? When? For what? Uh, well, so I can challenge myself. So now they start thinking, <laughs> like, okay, what? Why do I even care about competing? Why did I set this goal? And the for what, when you start going down that rabbit hole, leads to the why. And it always comes down to arriving in a place where you're meeting some need of yours. And once you define the need, you realize that it's not about the back squat. It's not about the 500 pounds. It's not about winning, but it's actually about getting the need met. And this is where I can give you an example of uh, something that I I ask at my seminars. Um, I ask people, hey, who here wants to make a million dollars? And of course, everyone's like, yeah, me, me, I want to, I want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, cool. Okay. So everyone's eager to, to make a million dollars. Everyone's eager to go to the Olympics. Everyone's eager to squat 500 pounds. Okay. Now let's see who's willing to put in the work to get there. Everyone, of course, this is always a group of highly uh, motivated individuals. So everyone's willing to put in the work. So now as a coach, I I make a basic assessment. I'm going to assess where you're standing. So I ask people, uh, okay, if you want to make the million dollars, let's see if if you can do that with what you're doing today. And of course, everyone's at the seminar, so no one's making any money. No one's making million dollars. So the next question is, okay, do you actually have a job? Yes. Cool. How much money does that, that job pay you? X amount. So we can estimate how much money that job pays you per, per hour, per second even, and estimate how many seconds, how many minutes, how many hours, how many days, how many years you have to work to achieve your goal of $1 million. Once you give them the, 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 the goal, the plan uh, to achieve the goal, people realize, oh shit, this takes a lot of work. <laughs> Right. So so now some people start backing off, but the majority of the room is in and uh, they're willing to do the work. The truth is, and evidence shows that the majority of people don't reach their goals. They set out to go to the Olympics. They don't make it. They set out to make a million dollars. They don't make it. 
they send out they set out to squat 500 they don't make it right the majority of people fall short of their goals so i decide to flip the script here and the way i do this is i say okay i'm going to give you 1 million dollars up front very simple you get the million dollars right now the only thing you have to do is guarantee me by signing this contract that you will work for me for 15 years, 20 years, 10 hours a day, every day, no breaks taken, um, do you sign the contract? Would I sign it? I don't know. I'm just, <laughs> you, I'm, I'm just giving the listener some space to think about that. Got it. And most likely, you won't sign the contract because you don't want to be a slave of that process. You don't want to be a slave better said, of that outcome. So what is it you really want? Is it the muscle up? Is it the 500 pound squat? Is it winning the, the CrossFit Games? What is it you really want? And how can you achieve that right now? And usually what people really want is to feel fulfilled. They want a, a, a feeling of fulfillment that supposedly will give them the ability to do something with. So once you get the million dollars, it's not about getting the million dollars, but it's rather asking yourself, what are you going to do with the million dollars? What happens? If you start running that inventory, you start realizing that you're going to run out of the million dollars really quickly, that that is just a passing moment. Winning the Olympics, stepping onto the podium, that's just a passing moment. Squatting 500 is just a passing moment. What does that benchmark really mean to you? And with that benchmark, hitting that benchmark, what can you do with that? And that is the true question. And that is where now wants become needs and needs can be met before you even arrive. And you start becoming part of the actual process in a way that you are proactive within it. And you start to change your performance at a way higher level. This is no longer a physical expression. This is a 100% emotional and, and intellectual um, expression. And this is where I'm bringing people to the side of uh, emotional intelligence. And I think that exercise is incredible. Uh, and I really appreciate you uh, sharing that because... I think that's just a great, great way to spot check someone on, do you really want what you say you want? Um, you know, put it, putting it up front like that and like, how, what are you willing to do now for that? Uh, I think that that's, that's phenomenal. Great, I, I, great uh, exercise. Thank you. I, I, I'm glad you like it. Um, it's been very powerful and it's uh, extremely valuable. And, and those who are willing to participate in an exercise like this, start realizing that they belong anywhere they want to be. And it's beautiful. And so you, you mentioned earlier that you didn't really, or you don't really like being associated with the fitness space. Um, what is it about that, that you don't like, or, you know, weren't really fond of, uh, cause you kind of, it sounds like you kind of fell into it, uh, not, not a hundred percent intentional. So what is it that, that kind of makes you push back there? Yeah. So when, when you have a space and, uh, a group of people, uh, who in their heads, um, the majority of the, the, the group that are, are partaking in this thing and even leading this, this, um, this space uh, have a skewed view uh, that comes through this highly commercialized lens that has um, basically stereotyped what fitness means and it's uh, presenting it in a way that is uh, visual in terms of what you should look like, even when you move, even uh, the way you move. Uh, you're you're already missing the point. You're you're getting um, the wrong side of the coin here because that is just the, the byproduct. 
But when you reverse engineer yourself into that expression, you get lost in the mechanical capacity of things. And I'm so thankful um, a, a movement such as CrossFit came around where it became uh, more simplistic and it was about a more holistic approach to health. And when it came to fitness, it was about having uh, measurable and repeatable data that allowed you to uh, continue to build on some basic movement patterns. I think that was beautiful. But even even CrossFit, uh, as as awesome as it, as it is, is still falling really short because we are still succumbing to um, the commercialized version, and that's why. Uh, the CrossFit Games, the sport of CrossFit, is bigger in terms of the representation of the stereotype of fitness than the actual methodology itself and the actual holistic approach itself. And the fact that we as human beings participating in a space such as the fitness space are not willing, are not willing to be holistic in our approach and do the stuff that is not as sexy up front and talk about that at the front line is where we're running into trouble, in my opinion. And we continue to run ourselves into the same wall. Just, so is what just... I'm doing is just putting myself just a little bit off to the side and saying, hey, uh, that circle you're in is awesome, but that circle doesn't have to be bound by by the arbitrary walls that you're putting around it. And so if I had to, if I asked you, you know, say we had a, you might not like this question, but well, I'll try it out anyway. If we I, like ha- every, I, I like every question. If we had, <laughs> if we had a pie chart uh, for, mm-hmm. he, for a human being. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just on, on being well-rounded, being a good human being. You know, that's a lot about what this podcast is about. It's not just about, mm-hmm. you know, one thing or the other. So, I mean, you don't have to give exact percentages, but like, how would how would you break that up? Like, what what size of the pie is fitness? What size of the pie is uh, nutrition? And what else is involved? I don't know. Uh, if if we know, if we knew, we we would we wouldn't be having this conversation. Right. And even even if we knew, would that help you? It would give some direction, but I don't know if it would, if it would be the the answer. Exactly. We all know that there's some basic uh, standards and principles we should operate around, but every single day that goes by, we are constantly having to go and assess them. So no matter what the balanced prescription is, it doesn't solve the problem. Right. We have all this data, which is fantastic. And uh, I I am all about fact and evidence and science. I live by that. But I also know that the number does not solve my problem. The uh, spacing, the perfect spacing out and structure of my day does not solve the problem. It is me, the individual, it's myself that is the problem. And it's that that we need to change. And this is where the concept of intent comes in. For example, CrossFit talks about intensity, right? (laughs) I talk about intent. If I go in to train, uh, I have no interest in competing against the prescription that is on the board, but rather competing against who I know I can potentially be and then see how close to my potential I actually am. And in the process of competing with myself, I become 100% aware in my process, in the way that I'm executing. And when I come out on the other end, I use the results, the data, to compare it to the people around me, to compare it to myself and to what I thought was possible. And then I make the next decision. And I think it goes beyond our lifetime uh, in terms of how we practice this intent every time we move, every time we do anything, every time we act, to be able to establish the most complete approach to the practice and then 
in retrospect, be able to get the data. The data never comes ahead of time. It always comes in retrospect. So uh, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to inspire people to take action on. Would you consider yourself a disciplined person? Uh, yeah, at, at many levels, I'm, I'm extremely disciplined. Uh, at others, I'm, I'm a complete uh, free spirit, uh, a guy that just lets go and lets it happen. And which areas would you say you're disciplined? That's a great question. Uh, it, it varies. It varies. Um, I am extremely intentional in the way that I interact with people. So, for example, as you're speaking to me or asking me questions, I'm extremely disciplined in the way I'm organizing my thoughts to be able to present to you uh, the most complete, the most simple, and at the same time compelling uh, explanation of of where I currently stand and what you're asking for. Um, there are no days off for me. I, I, I show up every day. I, uh, I give myself uh, the, the chance to be disciplined in uh, how I see food, how I see relationships, how I see um, my days. Um, and I act on that daily. It's just not set in stone the way that I do it. That's where this concept of freestyle, which we haven't really addressed yet, but um, uh, which is what people maybe uh, know me from for from my book or uh, from my seminars. But uh, yeah, there's a freestyle approach to a disciplined type of lifestyle. Yeah, so so let's talk about that. I feel like uh, we did go on a couple. Uh different areas there, you know, um, you're very interesting guys. I'm really enjoying the conversation. Um, so let's talk about, uh, the, the freestyle concept. Yeah. So the, the, what I realized was when I got out of gymnastics was that there wasn't only one way of doing things that there was an infinite number of ways of doing things. And, and the infinite number came from the infinite number of expressions that each individual had towards simply living. And I realized that this concept of freestyle was uh, the concept that uh, was so fascinating to me in college, was, which was the, the infinite concept of the universe and the ever-changing uh, concept of, of motion. And uh, that is the, the, the essence of, of what freestyle kind of stood for. But as uh, time went on, I realized that in order for uh, an infinite approach, an infinite um, level of, of movement and behavior and change, there, there need to be this um, acceptance of what is in this current moment and respect towards what is outside of our control. So freestyle became this acceptance and respect of all styles, all individuals. And as time went on even more, what, what that ended up crystallizing into was this concept of, of unity. And within that um, unity uh, lay some universal principles for, for living, for performing, for um, anything that an individual may care for. And Whatever it is that you care about that comes up every day for you, that right there is what you need to become obsessed with. And that obsession is where the discipline, the discipline is, is developed. And that's where you have to show up every day to practice, to see, to witness the thing that you care about. If that's squatting with a barbell so you can go to the Olympics and weightlifting, do that. If that's writing poetry, do that. If whatever that is, do it. And when you do it, you will get to a point where you come out on the other side and you realize that the teachings that that thing that you care about 
contain universal principles that are infinitely transferable to all other crafts, all other styles, and you gain uh, an understanding of what this world is that allows you to navigate it in peace and performing at the highest level. That is freestyle. And uh, how long... How long did that take? I, I didn't get a time frame necessarily, but how long did it take you kind of to develop that the, the concept there or realization? Mm, well, it's been, what, 18 years, I guess. Uh, so it's almost 20 years of, of kind of thinking about this and seeing it across every single domain. Uh, yeah, so it's like two decades of, of consciously thinking about it. And you're a father, correct? I am, yes. You have uh, how many kids? Uh, just just one. Uh, my my wife Tanya and I we 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 became foster parents actually uh, in 2014, and uh, we ended up adopting uh, uh, this this girl who at the time was a teenager. So yeah, we have a teenager. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, yeah. have you been able to? relay these concepts successfully uh to her um so the answer is i don't know uh if i've relayed those concepts but what i do know is that um one of the most basic forms of communication is is uh, body language it's movement and uh, she definitely mimics uh, the way that we behave and interact with the world. Uh, so uh, a lot of those principles are underlying those behaviors. And whether she is aware of it or not, yes, there is definitely some influence. But um, as, you, as you may imagine, uh, she's her own person and does her own thing, is, is finding her own way, and uh, hopefully... Uh, what will end up happening is that as she grows into the woman that she she is inside, she she will be simply a better version of who we are. Love that man. I love your approach to almost everything we've talked about. You know, that's that's really cool. Um, and one thing I'd like to know is uh, maybe more from a business standpoint. Now, uh, this this pivot. You said you're kind of making a shift from. Mm -hmm. You know how how has that been? How what are the what are your challenges like what are how do you feel about it yeah it's uh it's been hard it's been really really hard actually and and the pivot started in 2013 uh when i was very deep in the crossfit space and i i back then i thought i had to say yes to certain things to be able to make the impact that i wanted and i i ended up in some relationships where i i I wasn't satisfied. I, I didn't feel like um, I was providing what I could provide, and I, I, I wasn't getting what I, I could get out of it. And although I was uh, financially doing amazing and uh, I was really safe, and uh, in a way uh, I had a lot of recognition and I had uh, reached a point where uh, most people would kill for my position, um, I was extremely unhappy. So I, I ended up um, cutting ties with all of these relationships and, and uh, business relationships as well that uh, led me to really start from scratch. And uh, I actually put myself in a very deep hole that I, I began to slowly climb out of. And um, as of last year, I slowly started emerging. And on the other side, and now uh, the beauty of this is that uh, the people who were were there for the right reasons and um, were were really aligned with uh, the impact that I want to make a, as as an individual and, and collectively, uh, they're still around and uh, and now I, I I get to operate under uh, this umbrella of. Uh, freestyle connection um which i had i tried to launch several times after 
my gymnastics wad uh, ventures back in the day and, and CrossFit ventures. And and uh, now successfully launching it in a way where I can offer training, uh, physical training, uh, but I can also uh, put a lot of emphasis on what's behind it, which is the mindset. And it's performing at a level where we're articulating people's passion. And I've been able to find ways to um, create healthy relationships that uh, create the right cash flow to be able to inject that cash flow into the right things and, and build the systems, build the machines, build the teams, develop the people that need to be developed so uh, we can take the action that we believe we need to take to be able to get people uh, to start paying some attention to themselves and to exercising some self-love and uh, developing themselves beyond the movement. Now, having gone through all that, if, uh, so say there's someone listening who's maybe just now starting out in business, um, what would your advice to them be? Mm. Everything's going to be okay. Uh, that's <laughs> the first thing I would say. And the worst case scenario is you end up alone under a bridge starving and then you die that's that's the worst case scenario okay <laughs> um so that that's that's the that's the truth um the truth is we're all trending towards death that's that's gonna happen we're all gonna die and that is actually uh one of our our, our biggest gifts in this life because it's a reminder of the limited amount of time that we have here right now. And the question that uh, I ask is, what are you going to do with this time? What are you going to do? And I believe if you have the chance to um, do it your way, the ideal way, you would probably avoid certain relationships uh, saying yes to certain things and you would choose in a, the way you behave in, in a slightly different fashion. And usually that choice would be fully aligned in your rational brain, your rational mind, your heart, what you really feel and your gut and your nervous system. And it may be unclear to many as you behave this way, and it may be a slower process. But if you continue to act on that, you will gain speed. And what you'll notice is that if you open your heart and yourself to being vulnerable in the process of doing that, those who truly believe in you and truly love you will come to you and will support you, and they will never ever let you end up under a bridge or dead so you'll realize that you're not alone and that you deserve the success that you dream of and that you feel is in your heart and that is in your mind at night but then you forget about it or uh put it away in the morning when when uh it comes to it so just know that everything's going to be okay and uh if you just trust your gut and your instinct and you operate under this notion of making a positive impact for yourself and others, um, it's going to work out. I think that's great advice. All right, man, we're going to get to the quick fire questions of the show. Are you ready? Hit me. What's the hardest workout you've ever done? Uh, life. Life. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a lot of endurance for this one, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's a, it's a tough one. Life is a tough one, right? It is. Hi, right, man. In your opinion, what's the best activity for building mental toughness? Uh, well, I would say, I would say um, the meditation, but here's the thing. Meditation can happen in any aspect of your life. So let's say you, you are training and you're going in to do uh, a workout. You have an opportunity to be 100% present in every single movement that you perform. And as you do that, 
the goal here to uh, develop mental toughness is acting like you care. Care about what you're doing. If you're meeting resistance, you're finding a place where uh, you're, you're starting to react, getting mad, getting uncomfortable, uh, feel like you're in pain, move towards the place that you believe you really care about. And even if it is uncomfortable, hang on to that for a little bit, lean into it. I think that's where you'll find some very uh, powerful nuggets uh, that you can take home with you. I think it's really cool that you you mentioned, you know, it, it can be in any activity because I this is not something that that has become habitual for me, but um, having like a I, I just got a little too busy, overwhelmed, and like I, I ran into the the gym in my garage and I was like working out, but I was like slamming things around. I could tell I was just like not myself. You know, I was trying to go too fast and hurried, and I was like, I'm just going to treat this entire session as like one long meditation. So I turned on. Um, not meditation like sounding, but like this, this focus music, you know, it's just uh, instrumental type stuff. And then just uh, really, really put some intent on every single movement I was doing in between sets. I would really focus on my breathing and man, it was a really, really enjoyable experience. So I think uh, just going, hitting home on your point of like, try it out in different areas if you don't want to, you know, only try it one, one way. That's awesome. That is awesome. All right. If you could only have one piece of equipment to train with for the rest of your life, what would it be? The surface of planet Earth. I like it. Mm -hmm. All right. The question of the show, what is the best advice you have for becoming a better human? This is 100% open-ended. Mm -hmm. Just be you. Be you. Don't be, don't be ashamed of it. Don't be scared of it. You the individual, you are wonderful the way you are. And one thing that I've been doing, uh, that I started a, a very uh, a subtle initiative on is uh, a project that I call the Be Proud Project, where the goal is to um, develop some newfound self-worth and finding pride in who you are. And basically all it is, it's at the end of the day, take some inventory on you and the things that define you that your qualities like are you proud of your qualities the qualities that you instill uh are you proud of your achievements for the day your your actions your behaviors are you proud of your possessions the things that you own are you proud of your relationships if the answer is yes to all four of those then you're going in the right direction or you may be delusional. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> if the answer is no, it is time to reconcile that. And one way to reconciling these things is if uh, there's one thing that you're not proud of, the first thing you must say to yourself is, I'm sorry. You need to forgive yourself. And forgiving yourself is moving towards, like we talked about earlier. And if you take the 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 words, I am sorry, and you translate them to Spanish, it translates as lo siento, which is I feel it. You must feel, you must feel what you're not proud of. You must feel what you are proud of. So feel it. The second thing you must say is I love you. And I love you is another way of saying I'm moving towards the thing that I'm not proud of. And as I move towards the thing that I'm not proud of, I am changing already and I'm becoming proud of what's to come. And the last thing is saying thank you. And thank you, gratitude, is simply an expression of positivity. It is your ability to see the positive intent. And when one can see the positive intent, one starts to gain perspective and understanding. And it's in the perspective and understanding that allows one to find clarity and be able to move forward and therefore find peace and simply peace because there is unity alignment within you and amongst the people uh, that you're you're surrounded by. I love it. All right, man. I'm sure people are going to want to check out, uh, you know, 
social media, your website, all that stuff. So where where's a good place for people to to find out more about you and what you're doing? Yeah, come and come and join uh, join me over at freestyleconnection.com. Uh, if uh, you want to get physical, we have a few programs there that uh, you can you can jump onto. The biggest thing about the programs is um, uh, the community that we're working on building behind it. We are starting some Facebook groups where I'm interacting. Some other coaches are interacting. And, uh, yeah, just building a, a connected network. And then uh, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook at Carl Powley. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Losers always whine about their best. <laughs>